Much has been written about James Meredith and what he accomplished during the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s. But who is James Meredith? Where did he come from? And what shaped his early years? Dad is the seventh of 11 children of Roxy Patterson Meredith and Moses Cap Meredith. Cap, as he was better known, was a strong-willed, fiercely independent man who refused to accept second-class citizenship for himself or his family. As a consequence of that, he essentially sequestered and isolated his family on his 84-acre farm four miles outside of Kosciuszko, Mississippi, which is the county seat for Itala County. On this farm, they had a variety of subsistence crops, a lot of food crops, and they also had a variety of animals, including horses and chickens and goats and cows, and even, as my father terms it to this day, milking cows. Now those milking cows, and this is something I didn't pick up until this weekend, those milking cows were very, very important to the Meredith family farm. The reason for that is pet milk had a huge plant or processing factory in Kosciuszko. The milking cows that my father milked, we sold that milk to the pet plant in Kosciuszko, which provided an income of cash to a rural family that was huge. The reason they were able to have a lot of those crops and a lot of those animals was because they had cash to buy it. And that came from selling that milk from those milk cows to the plant there in Kosciuszko, Mississippi. Also, a commercial product that they produced on that farm was cotton. Cotton, however, didn't play near as big a role to the family farm as those milk cows did. Another thing about that 84-acre farm that just totally fascinated my father was that the custom in farming is you share a fence. You put the fence on your property line and the two property owners uh, maintain that fence together. Well, Cap's independence and his, his essential uh, recoiling uh, of white supremacy, he didn't want any part of that. So he pulled his fence in a few feet from the, from the line and he built and maintained his own fence and treated that farm as if it was a sovereign nation of its own without any relationships with the neighboring countries. This, along with the dinner practice that I'll get to in a minute, were very, very significant in my father's formation for it drove home the point that his family, at least, did not have to be, did not have to conform to the morals or the norms, rather, of everyone else in the community. Everyone else shared a common fence line with their neighbors. The Merediths did not. Whenever the Merediths sat down to a meal, Cap blessed that meal. And then the kids would take turns reciting Bible verses. The young kids mostly repeated the Ten Commandments, but at every meal, this was repeated, whether it was breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Now, another norm in that area for him growing up was when families ate, the adults always ate first, and the children then ate, not in the Meredith house. In the Meredith household, all the kids ate first, then the adults. And this, according to my father, was very significant on nights where chicken was served for dinner. <laughs> because that determined which piece you were going to get. Again, a moral, a norm that others in his community that he saw on a daily basis did it one way, the Meredith family did it another way. Now, he lived on the family farm for the first 17 years of his life. Ultimately, he wound up buying that farm from his father 
in, as he got older and ultimately added on to it. And that farm is now 100 and I believe 40 something acres um, up from the original 84 acres. The typical dinner table conversation was always included the daily activities of the members of the family, but also the weather. Because as my father told me this weekend, the weather was everything. Everything they did revolved around the weather. Chores, school, all of that was weather determinate. After dinner, the routine was for Cap to sit down and listen to the news. As my father got older, he started to join Cap in listening to the news every night. And after they would listen to the news, all the other kids got to fight over which uh, of their favorite radio programs they were going to get uh, to listen to. But during his school years, as he and Cap continued their listening to the news every night, he became increasingly aware of world affairs as a consequence of those daily events of listening to the news. And he began to follow the accounts of World War II very, very closely once the hostilities broke out. He liked Ike. He admired MacArthur. But Dad was most intrigued by the local GIs returning home and the stories that they would tell. But he also noticed how they took advantage of the GI Bill and the educational benefits that went along with it. Those who hadn't finished high school went back and got their diplomas. And in most cases back then, that high school diploma meant that that person had a marketable vocational skill in which they could earn a living. Others took that GI Bill and went on to college. For the black community around them, most of those that went and got degrees, they were getting teaching degrees so that they could then give back to the black communities from which they came. The returning soldier that had the most impact on my father directly was a man named Mr. White. Mr. White was an Atala County Training School industrial arts teacher. He was a shop teacher who had acquired the skill of carpentry while in service to his country. And although he could have earned good money, you know, good dollars, if he had decided to utilize that, that carpentry trade in other ways. But he was willing to pay it forward and take far less in teaching wages so that he could affect the future young black kids in that com community, mostly boys in his case because he was a shop teacher, but he wanted to mold the minds of these young black men as they came out into the world. And it was far more important for him to nurture those minds and work with those kids than to make money. And hence, it made a very big impression on my father. When dad was 17 years old, the Korean War began. And that ultimately had an even bigger impact on him than the World War II coverage. Of the graduating class that year, the year before my father graduated, there were eight boys. Remember, you're talking all black schools, so it was small as rule. Eight black men in that class. Of those eight, four of them volunteered within weeks of graduation and ultimately wound up in a unit that pushed the Koreans back to the Chinese border. But as the Chinese entered the war and began to push the Americans back, three of, of the four of those boys was killed in that campaign. This affected my father to the point where he left Kosciuszko and had to finish his high school education in Florida because he knew those boys, and he was friends with those boys. And hearing those stories, he could not go back to Atala Training School. So he went to Florida with one of his siblings was living at the time, 
and graduated from an all-black high school there. He then enlisted in the Air Force following the uh, lead of his brother Leroy. And while in the service, he met and married my mother, Mary June Wiggins, and they had me. Dad separated from the Air Force after nine years of service and made his way back to Mississippi to begin his war on white supremacy. He had seemingly strategized endlessly in the months prior, trying to decide which black college would provide him the best foundation from which to operate. There were non-state schools like Rust and Tougaloo, but in the end, he opted for a state institution. And after visiting and considering Alcorn, Valley State, and others, Dad opted for the urban setting of Jackson State College over the rural nature of the other schools. Having made his decision, he started putting those GI benefits to use and started getting his educational benefit as he uh, seen so many uh, soldiers do returning home from World War II. He would be glad he made the choice of Jackson State later on as Jackson State actually protected my mother and myself while my father concluded his studies at Ole Miss. Didn't know that till this weekend either. <laughs> the election of President Kennedy just changed everything. Having run on a platform of civil rights, my father thought that if it came down to it, President Kennedy would use the might and force of the United States Army against the state of Mississippi if Governor Ross Barnett opposed letting a Negro go and enter Ole Miss. So on January 31st of 1961, 11 days after the inauguration of Mr. Kennedy, Dad applied for admission to Ole Miss. He was only denied admission after he revealed that he was black. Now this news of his being a black launched a frantic series of negotiations between school officials, dad, the governor's office, the NAACP, as they tried to pressure him to accept conditional enrollment at Ole Miss. Now dad, of course, refused to accept any limitations on his rights and privileges as a student. I mean, after all, he was fighting for full first class citizenship and all the rights and privileges that meant. So why would he not want all the full rights and privileges of being a student in his effort to become a full citizen? Well, now officially denied, Dad filed a class action suit in May. So it took him that long. Essentially, February to May, with all this negotiating and you know what he could do, what he couldn't do, and was he willing to live by that or wasn't he willing to live by that? So on May 14, 1961, the class action suit to get dad into Ole Miss was filed. And over the next 17 months, the case made its way through Mississippi state courts, federal courts, and was ultimately decided by the United States Supreme Court on September 10th of 1962, when it ruled that indeed Ole Miss had to allow the Negro James Meredith to enroll. Took another three weeks. There's a bunch of back and forth between the Kennedy administration and the office of Governor Barnett because Governor Barnett had gone on statewide radio saying he was not going to let a black man into Ole Miss. Well, they negotiate with the Kennedy administration, particularly Robert Kennedy was involved in, in that negotiation. And ultimately, President Kennedy countered Mr. Bar Governor Barnett's radio announcement with a nationally televised <laughs> announcement that yes, the state of Mississippi was going to allow James Meredith in because the United States Supreme Court had ruled and this was a nation of laws and there was no, uh, there was no choice. The state was going to have to let him in. And so the stage was set. Dad arrived on the campus of Ole Miss on the 30th of September in 1962, about 6 o'clock in the evening. He was met by then Lieutenant Governor Paul Johnson. 
Johnson denied him access technically to the campus, but they sequestered, took my father to Baxter Hall, which was the dormitory that he stayed in his entire time there. But as word traveled around the campus and, and into the, the, the neighboring community of Oxford that my father actually was on campus, by eight o'clock, took him two hours from him showing up till active rioting at Ole Miss. That rioting ultimately cost two people their lives. But as the night waned on, and Mr. Kennedy sent down 33,000 U.S. soldiers to take control of the situation. The next day, my father uh, registered for class, and surrounded by a detail of 500 of his best friends, he took his place among the student body until he entered the Grove on graduation day of August 18, 1963, and walked across the stage, received his diploma, and became the first black man to be an alumni or alumna <laughs> of Ole Miss. <laughs> Dad did continue his education after Ole Miss. He spent a year at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria, and then he returned to the United States and studied law at Columbia Law School in New York City. Dismayed by the lack of enfranchisement, frankly, uh, by blacks, despite the enactment of the voting rights law the year before, my father felt that he had to do something to get people in Mississippi, particularly blacks, obviously, to register and vote, to take advantage of the opportunities that the Voting Rights Act had established for them. His vehicle of encouragement was going to be a 220-mile voter registration walk from Memphis, Tennessee, to Jackson, Mississippi. His vision for the Meredith Walk was a lone black man walking down the highways and byways of his home state, simply enjoying the benefits of his full citizenship. He would engage one-on-one -on -one with those he encountered and encourage and assist them if necessary in registering to vote. He didn't want the attention to be focused on large civil rights organizations or huge media, so he didn't want civil rights groups and he didn't want the media. He doesn't really talk about it, but you all are benefiting from my weekend chat. He didn't want women and children there either. And the reason for that is what happened in Birmingham with the women and children. And he didn't want that on his conscience in one of the events that he was hosting, he was, he was in charge of. So he didn't want women and children there either. Now, on June 6, 1966, from the Peabody Hotel in downtown Memphis, which, by the way, he wasn't allowed to stay at, he started his march. As he entered Mississippi the following day, he was shot by, James, uh, by Aubrey James Norvell, who at the time was an out-of-work hardware clerk for Memphis. The, the shooting itself was a very interesting thing. My father had struggled for weeks before the march started on whether or not he should take a gun or a Bible. He opted for the Bible. After being shot, he wished he'd have taken the gun. But as he was walking down the street, the highway, Highway 51, there were people around him. You can't see it in those photos, but there were people around him. That's Norvell. Now, he was on the same side of the road as my father. Again, other people there. Norvell came out with his shotgun and said, everybody get down. All I want is James Meredith. And they did what he told them. Law enforcement scattered like flies and let my father get shot. It's not pictured here, but as he made his way across the road, um, one of the photographers there 
took a picture that actually won the Pulitzer Prize that year. Norvell actually, because of this, actually gained some notoriety. He was actually the first white man, I think in America, I know in Mississippi, but I think in America, to go to jail for attempting to kill a black man. Now, granted, he was only sentenced to five years, and three of those five were suspended. But the fact remains, first white man, at least in the state of Mississippi, to go to jail for attempting to kill a black man. Happened during the Meredith March. After the shooting, shockwaves went through both the media and civil rights organizational phone trees as news of the shooting became common knowledge. At one point, my father was even pronounced dead on the evening news. A broadcast my family's glad my mother didn't watch at the time. While my dad lay in a Memphis hospital recovering after surgery, he soon realized that support for his cause could no longer be contained in a lone black man traveling the state's highways and byways. The people wanted to act and they needed the leadership offered by established civil rights organizations and to that end, three groups stepped up to take the reins of the march and guide it all the way to its conclusion in Jackson. The most notable of these groups was a Southern Christian Leadership Conference under the leadership of Martin Luther King, Jr. However, the most significant organizational participation came from Stokely Carmichael and Floyd McKissick's Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in conjunction with the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And the reason they are the ones that I say are far more significant than what Martin Luther King brought to it, who brought a lot, he brought a ton of people, a ton of media, and has my respect and admiration, but it was SNCC, and it was the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party that did the hard work of registering those voters and organizing those communities in every county down that 220-mile walk. And while I think King is awesome, and he's great, and I love him, the function of this exercise was to get people to vote. And that was done by Stokely and by the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. As a show of solidarity, when the walk resumed, it was renamed the Meredith March Against Fear. And while there was sporadic racial tension between the marchers and state troopers and all the assortment of local law enforcement agencies, as well as some white rabble-rousers along the route from time to time. But for the most part, the marchers were left in peace. The number of marchers grew by the hundreds on a daily basis, and they were supported primarily by the generosity of black people along the march route who provided the marches with food and water, first aid, and occasionally shelter, although for the most part, the marches had to sleep out under the stars or under large tents. This was the norm until June 16th when Stokely Carmichael was arrested in Greenwood, Mississippi while attempting to set up tents at the city's colored school. Still seething from his arrest and being held for what he thought was longer than he should have been held, when Stokely returned to the site where he was attempting to put up those tents, there was a, uh, an impromptu rally that was going on. Stokely was really upset. And when he took that stage, without any scripted anything, he delivered what is known as the infamous Black Power speech. That was given in Greenwood during the Meredith March. Blacks nationwide rallied around that call for the economic and political empowerment and new marches flooded into the state. They joined thousands more Mississippians who finally had the gumption to stand up and act once they saw the nation coalesce around their cause. And this was the case 
when they entered Canton. And in Canton, Mississippi, once again, while they were trying to set up tents for the night, they were assaulted, this time by Mississippi state troopers who were actually going against the directive of then Governor Paul Johnson, who said the Mississippi state, state troopers would protect the marches. Well, in Canton, those Mississippi state troopers deployed tear gas and in conjunction with other law enforcement agencies, beat, beat those marchers senseless to the point where local churches started going door to door in Canton and surrounding areas looking for the wounded. It was that many of them. And it was, it was nasty. But it did not break the spirit of the marchers. They continued on. They continued on until they got to Tougaloo College right outside of Jackson. And at Tougaloo, they were provided hot showers, I'm sorry, warm showers, hot food, and a soft cot. They were entertained by celebrities supporting the cause, including James Brown, Dick Gregory, Dick Gregory and even Marlon Brando came and addressed the audience. As they left Tougaloo the following morning, my father rejoined the march and led the assemblage of 15,000 strong into Jackson, down State Street, and to a rally at the Mississippi State Capitol, where Dad, Stokely, and MLK addressed the largest march crowd in the history of Mississippi. While some observers claim the mantra of black power was the only notable outcome of the Meredith March Against Fear, according to far more Mississippians, it was a Meredith March Against Fear that ended the practice of crimes against blacks committed by whites not being prosecuted. It galvanized community organization within and among the various black communities. And it fostered a comparatively high voting record and ability to participate, of, of normal citizens to participate in the public policy process than anywhere else in the Deep South at that time. Again, it has been my profound pleasure to speak to you all today. And I hope I've been able to give you some insight into my father's person, who he is, where he came from, and maybe a little bit into how what he did affected me. <laughs>